Okay, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure standing here today because I realized that uh, I'm nearly as old as university is, or at least I'm staying for more than 30 years at this university. And uh, my career started actually with Yo, as one of his graduates, one of his first graduates in Nijmegen, and I'm still working together with you here. So there, there are some connections here as well. But uh, my, my talk is about people in transformative times. And it's, I thought it's more or less like my statement. And I will tell it only once. And then you may forget it or remember it. And my statement builds further on Henry Levent's talk. He, he was saying, I'm frustrated. And I thought, well, this is not even getting close to how I feel. Because I feel more like the Austrians. I did some consultancy work somewhere in the 90s in Austrian higher education. And they were, it's a lovely country, lovely people. And uh, I tried to change our universities. And of course, guess what? It didn't work. And they had an explanation for it. And they said to me in German, like, Wim, die Situation is hoffnungslos, aber nicht ernst. <laughs> Meaning, like, the situation is desperate, but don't take it serious. And I thought, uh, with the Austrians, it was like, there was a kind of denial, denial that times were changing, but there was also a sense of hope contained in it. And I thought, well, and that kept bothering me in my work, in my career, and I thought, well, the issue is we are running out of time. And the, normally, you know, they would show you pictures like it's two minutes before 12. Otherwise, we're too late. And my point is, we are too late because it already happened. Change already occurred without us even noticing it. And I was inspired by a talk which was given by a dean of Ohio University in the 90s when he wrote down the following. When I woke up this morning, to find out that the world had changed, even without my noticing. And we had moved from the industrial age to the infor information age. The dominant technology had changed from the machine to the computer, and the strategic resource from capital to knowledge. And when I was rereading this, I thought, well, those guys were right. It just happened without that we were even aware that something had changed our life. And when I was in Madrid a couple of months ago, I found you know, I was walking in a famous park called the El Retiro. There were kids listening to a, a person. And those kids, sing, this, those kids were absorbing what the speaker was uh, saying. And that reminded me uh, again of Milton and Stinson when they said, but students are no longer limited to interaction with local faculty. They listen to the most inspirational lecturers at the time, most useful to their learning. Their learning community is a truly a global community accessed through electronic technology. And so, but there is a challenge, and there is also a frustration, because uh, what, if this is all true, that change already happened without us even noticing it, the way we work might look more or less like this guy who was standing next to this group. He was desperately trying to attract an audience. He was making fun of himself, but no one was listening to the guy. And I think that's the kind of feeling many times you have as a lecturer when you are standing in a lecture hall like this, and students are all the time messaging, using their laptops, working on their iPhone, and you are working in a with a traditional technology. And it looks like we are losing them for whatever reason. And there was one more event which made me think about what is it when we talk about envisioning our time. And I thought, well, it's on experiencing transformative times. And it was about Obama. Because when Obama visited Queen Elizabeth a couple of years ago, he was very polite and he gave the Queen an iPod. And it contained photographs and stories and music about her visit when she was in the US. And of course the Queen was polite as well. Because she gave Obama an official picture of her and her husband in a silver frame photograph. <laughs> and she had been doing this for, during her whole her career. And I thought, what more can be said about the different age we are living in? And I also noticed, look at the size of Obama and Michelle as compared to the Queen. <laughs> and of course, you can guess, I'm more like Obama and, okay. So there is something going on. 
I thought, well, if this is all happening to us, and, and you look at the way a master university is trying to find its way in all of this, it's about managing transformative times. And managing transformative times, I started to think, okay, now if you want to manage, you want to be in control, one way or another, we need to know certain issues. And where is the knowledge? And we need to know something about their environment, we need to know something about our own university, our own department, and maybe we need to know a little bit about ourselves, we as a professional, as lecturer. And that's my starting point of my talk. So why are we here? Of course we are here because we have to celebrate something, like an anniversary, but so it goes further. The fact that you are here, and I would say it goes beyond the usual suspects who would normally visit this kind of meeting, it's about rethinking the nature of education at a university like ours, and the thing which makes us proud to be at this university. And so the question of first is, uh, do we understand our environment? Do we really understand what value we are bringing in as an educational institute. And one of the benchmarks, of course, we're always comparing ourselves with Harvard. That's a natural benchmark for us when trying to think about what's the nature of a university when you're working at a university like Maastricht, or maybe Ivy League University, you know, Princeton, Yale, whatever. And I thought, well, I disagree. Because in my mind, the strongest competitor we have to meet up with is the following institute. Because for students, Google represents the valuable source to information. It's access, it's a way of getting knowledge, which was till 30 years ago, or even till 10 years ago, you know, you had to take your bike, go to a library, subscribe, and then maybe you were lucky when this book was there. And if you got a book, it was filthy, it was used by others and whatever, but now it's Google. Within a second, you got what you're looking for. And that's one of our main complaints from teachers is that we have to compete with Google. For, because for students, this is what knowledge is all about. The other issue is there are other sleeping giants as well. And when I come further on my talk, I will show you that IBM is one of those sleeping giants, which may be our main competitor for the next decade. And one of the examples in this was when I visited a company in Paris just a couple of months ago, they were selling 300 accredited courses to any business school in the world with the top speakers and top leaders in the industry for just 90,000 euro per year. And business schools in France and all around the world are buying those 300 courses and they sell them and redistribute them, and they brand them with their own label. And that for me was a shock. 90,000 euros is less expensive than my annual salary. So, you know, where do we bring in the value? Why pay so much money for people like me? So, okay, so that kept me busy. Not my salary, of course, but okay. So I thought, well, then let's try and take a look, closer look at who are, who are the, what is our environment, who are our students, what is our next generation, and how can I decide on what our next generation needs. And my colleague, Amber Daly, she pointed out, well, if you start to think about our students is, and the age there are, most of those students enter our college without even knowing that cut and paste are very specific words from the industrial age. They are not about the modern age. And for them it's just there. Technology has always been there. For me, a phone was something with a wire. For them it's just, you buy it in a supermarket and then you get connected to something. They've never known a world without digital whiteboards. Our staff is still in training at the business school out on how to use them. And so there is an issue. And for them technology is just there. For me, it's still an add-on. And just to make clear what I, uh, I'm talking about, I've thought, well, I need to visualize this in one way or another. So it's not the laptop and books on one hand versus New Age. I thought, well, maybe I should show you a five-minute movie which makes clear what I want to say when talking about transformative science.
Yeah, that's good. Probably. Well, um, one of my colleagues said uh, when, when she saw this uh, video, um, it always touches me. I thought, well, uh, when I think about the university and why we are here, um, in a way this is inspiring because it helps us to find out what are our unique strengths and what can we do. And uh, so my question was, what's the academic response to all of this? And uh, when looking through uh, higher education literature about the situation in Britain, for example, I thought, well, this is getting close to Austria. Because uh, what they've been doing over the past 25 years is going from one efficiency move to another. And yes, they worked harder and even harder, and they did less, you know, their budget cuts were heavy, and yet they did it. But the problem, of course, is that uh, while there is this reduction in our budget, is that it looks like this is as far as they could go. And there is no way they could still be even more efficient. Because the consequence for, for academic staff has been like uh, resistance, uh, cynicism, and so forth. So what are, is the way to get out of all this? And that reminds me, do academics really live in a different world than business people? And in my mind, I don't. Of course, and any academic will, will try to convince me, no, him, you know, we are, we are different, our institutes are different, we, we deserve it to be treated in a different way like business. And I thought, well, it's simply, in my mind, it's just not true. Because the problems we're facing are problems of living in a super complex world. And that reminded me of some work I did in Scandinavia just a couple of months ago in the newspaper industry, where they asked me to help them out and rethink uh, leadership issues in, in the newspaper industry. Because the, the problem for them is that the average reader, it's, it's age is 60. And by definition, they're just losing their readers. And there's no way they can attract new uh, readers. So they were discussing, well, how can we get out of the situation? And theory says, well, there are two ways. One is you keep improving on what you have been doing so far, so making things better, and building further on current platforms. <coughs> That's a thing which NSA does, basically. And the way they do it is like this. They start to sell wine. But did they solve the problem? Of course they didn't, because the problem remained the same. There are no new readers anymore. Yet, that doesn't mean people are disinformed on what they are doing. So my question is, okay, what, what can we do? Should we continue the same way in a future time? I would say, well, universities are no longer in charge of their monopoly in terms of knowledge creating and uh, giving people access to knowledge. The other is that university as idea is just meaningless. Because what is a university? If you go to the UK, for example, you see mass institutes, which, are, which used to be the old polytechnics. Uh, you see the old traditional red brick universities. New institutes are emerging. So that's, it's a fuzzy image we have about what a university should be. And then look at academic staff. Current research says, well, something goes terribly wrong with our academic staff. Levels of psychological distress exceed those in high level of stress occupations, so it's actually emerging to doctors and nurses. So it looks like we squeeze them out. And this is as far as we could go. So the consequence is no. So the question is, how are we going to do it? And uh, so what are the drivers of change? Well, Henry Levine <coughs> mentioned uh, so some of them. Uh, he said, well, there's globalization, social changes for the change in demographics. And I thought, well, one of the things uh, which inspired me is the work of uh, Sugata Mitra. He is a famous uh, Indian uh, uh, educational technologist who was starting to think is, 
Why is it that education doesn't reach those places where education is needed most, especially in those people where people are poor, because people don't want to teach over there? And he invented, just like an ATM, over there that's an internet machine. And this internet machine was put as the hole in the wall. And uh, he gave people, kids, you know, living in the slums, he gave them access to those uh, machines, and they started to learn themselves. And then he developed the technology. And of course, there was also a sponsor, IBM, the sleeping giant. And of course, they do it for a certain reason, which of course we won't discuss over here. But the interesting part of it is when you start looking at his work is the response he got from the academics. And that's intriguing. The intriguing, the first response was by Ben Jarvis. And he said things where I thought, this is yesterday, because I've seen this happening 30 years ago when I started working at Maastricht University. Because he was criticized that his work lacked rigor. It lacked academic rigor, frameworks. We need the basics first. And you are just posing questions, so in a way, you are just teaching them tricks to get out of the whole situation. I thought, well, this is typically the kind of discussion we have at Maastricht University all the time. Should we teach them problems? and how to analyze, or should we give them the basics first? And then who's, you know, who's knowing who's doing the right job? And then the other person said, with all due respect, sir, I think you're missing the point. The point is not that they should learn the answer on the question. The point is that they should understand the way they think and how they acquire knowledge. And I think this is where it connects to the work of Maastricht University. And here is also, in my mind, one of the let's say benchmark, if we are looking for our future, how we can continue. The other thing is, when you start looking about e-technology, e-learning, well, th these are taken some data from, from the US. 4.6 million students were taking at least one online course during the fall 2000 day term. If you look at growth rates, they exceed the growth rate as in terms of uh, annual enrollment. And then it says, well, more than uh, one in four higher education students now take at least one course online. So you see, no, the question is not whether we should ignore it, it's just there in my mind. So, well, and it's up to us whether we're doing something with it. Now, let's compare it with the old classroom. And I think the old classroom, and this is, you know, it's, this could have been me sitting somewhere in the classroom over there, sitting with 44 uh, kids, uh, and, and then something happens in your life and you get transferred. But I think the, the whole thing is there is a uh, a growing disbalance with what we have in mind, what we're doing, and the way it should be done. And the disbalance is between the way we teach and make people learn on one hand and your risk content, which is uh, as printed in books. So books, making, thinking me about books, I thought, let's go back and see how people responded when the book was introduced in education. And I found Socrates. And Socrates, of course, is, you know, he is an unquestioned expert on anything. Yeah, so, so if you w critique, don't. Because Socrates wrote down, you have invented an elixir not of memory but of reminding. And you offer your pupils the appearance of wisdom, not true wisdom, for they will read many things without instruction and will therefore seem to know many things when they are for the most part ignorant, since they are not wise but only appear wise. And the issue of Socrates, although he was uh, extremely hurt by the fact that, that people thought teachers were no longer necessary. And of course, Socrates was the teacher. And, the, and I think the issue was that there is a difference between teaching people know what, the way it's written down in books, and know how, which you can only learn in your relationship with your teacher. But of course, you may always, as academics like to question the work of Socrates, Socrates already criticized himself for what he was saying. And he said, well, by all means marry. If you get a good wife, you'll be happy. If you get a bad one, you will become a <laughs> philosopher. So forget about Socrates. So what could help us further? What are the constraints then for change? And I think Henry Levin already mentioned several of them. Is, and my mind is, first, we should know your university. And you should know your department you're working uh, in. So I did some work on this as well. The world we are living in is, is, first, is know thyself. It's a professionalism which stands in the way. It's my passion for content. It's my passion for research. And as a consequence of my passion, 
my knowledge is drifting away from what learners need. And, uh, and of course, I want to convey this passion to others. I want to share it with others. And yet, of course, that's confronting me with a problem. And the problem is coveritis. It's a famous disease in Germany, for example, or in the UK. It means meaning like you want to cover everything in teaching because you're passionate about what you're doing. But that stands in the way of what learners are looking for. The second is our functional silos called disciplines. I think what's happening in science is that because we're structured along the lines of disciplines, that's good. Scientists should work in disciplines. Yet, in terms of the consequences of organizing it at a university, that is at least an issue we should work on on how to make connections between disciplines. The third issue is our narrow view on scholarship. We think that scholarship is defined in terms of A and B journals. While uh, managers are talking about valorization, you know, subsidy, you know, drawing, um, adding value to your region, and so forth. So, and that puts a lot of pressure on, 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 on people. And finally, it's our struggle or my struggle with management and leadership. So how are we manage organizations which are capable to do so? And that's an, is an issue when you start talking with, with uh, leaders in industry. They will tell you the same story. It's so hard and so difficult to connect top knowledge workers within a company in such a way that you get the most out of it. And I think basically, if you would put it more black and white, and you put it to the extreme, the issue is as follows. The issue is, when you start talking about management and leadership, But this always happens. You show this picture and it's very silent. And then 30 seconds, like a people dare to laugh. Because the key, when, when you look at the work of this cartoon, is it's, the issue is not that he wants to blame us, but it's much more on how can we organize people in such a way that those who lead can get the most out of it, and those who are led, you know, can get most out of their leaders. And I think there is an issue as well, as, as, as well here, because in a way it depicts the, the the tension between disciplines and departments on one hand and the way you connect scientists to get most out of it. Well, so what's it going to look like? Transforming PBL and transformative time. I think one of the issues, of course, is, is e-learning a techno-fantasy, yes or no? And I thought, well, there is an issue, and it was already said by Henry Levine, because we used to have school radio, school television, and finally, you know, that was, didn't become part of our life. The other issue is, well, technology help us out in further classification of higher education. Certainly it will. But the issue is not whether higher education should be more massified, but it's more whether you can get massive individualization, which is something else. So, and then will we be market-driven rather than producer-driven? That's also an issue we're constantly facing. Uh, look at the kind of discussions we have at Maastricht University. Is, should it be supply-driven, yes or no, and what are the consequences for it? So what's the challenge? Because I want to close my talk with a positive view. And the challenge is, as Amber Daly said, my colleagues, if you start looking about the way it's being done is that students are increasingly exposed to a uh, multimedia environment, and it's just part of their life. So the issue is not whether we should do something with it, no, the way is how it should be done. Because reality says we have to adapt to those cha uh, uh, changing uh, demands of our students, one way or the other. And we have to respond to them as a learning tool and a way of learning in their students' daily life. So where's the connection with UM? And uh, when you read about future scenarios on, for higher education, one future scenario is, of course, that, well, we just keep going on the way we always did, and then, well, we keep complaining and become cynical or whatever, we give students certificates and all that. But in my mind, it's more like, it's like the post-industrial area. It's, you have to think about what, what is the place of learning? What's the natural eco uh, ecology you need within a university to make people learn? And I think that U University of Maastricht has thrived on and we became very successful by two key ingredients. And the first was that whatever students were learning, it always happened through peer learning. 
And the other is we supported their learning in the path through problem-based learning. And now the technology might enable this to do it in a different way, yet still using the pillars of problem-based learning. The other is that this challenge is, uh, that's another warning we get, and yet we persist on using old technology. So that's a challenge for us. You know, I would say, like the Austrians, there's hope. And it's, there's an opportunity for us to continue that way. And the challenge is, of course, to stay grounded in this ecology we have developed so far in terms of learning and to make it appealing to our students. And that, I think, is the strength of this uh, university. Well, to conclude, what do you want this institution to be in 2020? So I thought for the panel discussion is, uh, well, know yourself. And do we know ourselves? And yes, we're doing, you know, the, the, there's a lot of potential in the project we're doing uh, currently in Learning at Work, the new Cyrus 2 project, Tulip, uh, leading and learning. But the thing is then, how can we push it further? So for the discussion, for me, it will be very interesting to ask ourselves the question, but what is keeping us away from doing it? And why are we not doing it yet? And maybe this can help this institution to, uh, to, be, to stay on and stay successful for the next 10 years. So thank you very much for giving me time to tell my story. Thank you.